What questions do you have about model rocketry? That's what we're going to talk about in this episode. Welcome to Advanced Construction Videos, where we show you how to tackle rocketry building techniques and more. On our website, we sell kits, motors, building supplies, and electronics. So come and learn, shop, build, and fly when you visit us at ApogeeRockets.com. Hi, I'm Tim Van Milligan from Apogee Components. We put out a survey to customers and viewers on this channel about what specific questions that they want me to answer. And we got probably almost two dozen questions that came in. And today I'm going to try to answer them. So let's get started. So the first one came from Ross Warren, 436 via YouTube. And he asked, should all park flyers get NAR membership to have that insurance? And I would say probably yes. The NAR insurance kicks in after your homeowner's insurance is exhausted. So if you don't own a home or if you're renting, it's good to have it. Uh, when you join the NAR, you can't opt out. So you're going to get it anyway. It's worth getting the NAR insurance. Being a member of the NAR is definitely worth it. And then you get the insurance as a bonus. Andy in Indy says, why are long burn, low thrust motors such as the F-15 so uncommon? Is it a manufacturing challenges, limited design space, harder to store because of the long grains or something else? Why are they harder to find? It's just manufacturing capacity probably. If manufacturers had infinite capacity, they could make as many motors as they want. They only have certain limited number of hours during the day, so they can't make everything all at once. So they have to stagger things out. And then, you know, the long burn motors, unfortunately, they don't sell as good as short burn motors. And the reason is you can't use them in heavy rockets. They can only be used in light rockets. And most of the rockets that are sold are on the heavier side. Typically, if you have a, a motor that doesn't sell well, it's probably going to be the last one made. Laura Collins, 1145, writes, Is there a way to repair bent tubes that have been crumpled a little bit from a lawn darting? Would inserting a coupler on the inside be the best way to reinforce it to work? That's actually a really good question, and I wish I would have brought an example here. Here is this rocket right here, and it's got a coupler in it to stiffen it up. So if you can get a coupler on the inside, that could be a way to repair the tube. The problem is once the tube is kinked, it's really hard to slide a coupler in there uh, because now everything's been crushed. I and mean, when you try to slide that coupler in, it just does not want to go. Let me see if I have a video on the app Apogee website. Let me open up a new page here. Go to ApogeeRockets.com. We go to the how-to and guides. We come down here to advanced construction videos. Click on that. Come over here to all videos. And this is all of our videos. And when you're on this page, what you do is you do a command F or on the Windows computer, it's Control F, and that will bring up a little finder window. And this is specifically going to look on this page. I'm going to look under the word repair, and I've used it 26 times. Uh, let me see if I can find repairing a tube. Oh, here we go. Um, actually, we have two videos, 362 and number 363. We'll show you how, you know, some methods on repairing those kink tubes. So when you go there, this will show you. And I think one of them is using a coupler on the inside. The only caveat I would say is when you're doing it, use epoxy because it's more forgiving than wood glue or white glue when you're gluing it in. Now, wood glue or white glue is going to be stronger because it actually grips into the fibers of the wood where epoxy doesn't. But when wood glue is gripping into the tube, it's drying out faster. And so when it dries out, it'll seize up on you and then it won't go where you want it to go. So if you use epoxy, while it technically is not quite as strong because, because it doesn't grip into paper the way wood glue does, but the epoxy is kind of, if you use a liquid epoxy, it acts like a lubricant. So you can slide it to where you want it into the tube. And then when it hardens, it'll stiffen right up. 
Ross Warren, 436, writes, what igniters are best these days for launching cluster rockets? Do you wire them in parallel all the time? I know Quest made some great low current ones in the past, but I think they're no longer available. Yes, the Quest ones are no longer available. Quest is still around, but those igniters, they were called the Q2 G2s, those are not. Now Quest is owned by Aerotech and now they call them First Fire and it's a completely different igniter. They can be used for clustering. This is one of those questions where the answer depends. And it depends on what motor you're using. So if you're using a black powder motor, you're gonna get a different answer than if you're using a composite motor for clustering. And let's go back to our videos on our website. Um, so this is our index of all of our advanced construction videos, kind of like what you're watching right now. Do a find on this page and let's look up the word cluster. And I used it 12 times. Okay, so here it is. Um, video number 282 is how to cluster motors with success. And now this will talk about the different ways to ignite motors. So black powder motors, the Estes igniters will work. They're the cheapest, but if you want something a little bit more easier to ignite, like such as your batteries are low, then you might want to go with a different igniter. So if you go to Firewire, Firewire Mini, that's what they're called. These igniters, they're a lot more expensive, but these are low current igniters or low voltage. And they will fit in most Estes motors, but the little plugs that come with the motors aren't going to fit because they're bigger than Estes igniters. But these are like, they go like that. They just flash and they ignite great. We use these all the time when we're clustering, like on our Nike Hercules rocket. It's a cluster and whenever you see us fly it, we usually use those igniters. So here's the Nike Hercules. And I believe on this page down here somewhere, there'll be a video of the rocket taking off. Like this one right here, this photo, you can see it's white smoke. So that's black powder. And so those were ignited using those Firewire Minis. When you're using composite motors, then you have to use the igniters that come with the motors. It's going to be different. They're, they're going to take more current, so you're going to need a bigger battery. And that clustering video will walk you through it. So go back to that clustering video. Robin the Kid writes, hard to find any questions he hasn't already answered in the videos and such laughing out loud. But I guess to know, I want to know all the pro tips to help when building an avionics bay. Pro tips. Well, I would start by building a kit like, like the Peregrine. This rocket right here has an eBay. Um, it's got a 30, this is a big rocket. So the engine diameter is 38 millimeters in diameter and it does have dual deployment capabilities. So you're gonna be building an eBay. I'm just going through here, seeing if I have images of the eBay. So here is what the eBay looks like without the electronics installed. This is a really nice eBay. <laughs> Mounting the electronics is going to be the same whatever eBay you use. What's different about eBay's is the access to the electronics on the inside. This particular eBay in this particular rocket has bulkheads that are removable and it has eyelets on the outside. That makes it easy to take those bulkheads off. And that's what I want when I, you know, that's my pro tip is have an eBay that you can pull apart as quick as possible. Because when you're building an eBay and you want to turn things on and off or you have to go and diagnose a problem inside the eBay, you want to get into it as quick as you can. So find an eBay that opens quickly. This particular one does open quickly. Use quick links on the ends of your shock cord. That will also help so you can unscrew those shock cords and get them off so that you can take the bulkheads off. So that's my pro tip. Horstman Aerospace writes, does a missile meter have a protective box, bay, or something to keep it safe during flight? I have in my little hand right here, um, the missile meter, it's a really tiny electronic altimeter. The answer is no. What you see here is what it comes with. If you want to protect it, I would use a payload bay like this rocket has right here. I know you can't see it from here, but there is a tiny loop on it. Let me see if I can give you a picture here from our website. So I'll go quickly through these. Okay, so here at the front end, there's a little loop which you can attach a string to tie to the base of the nose cone. And then once you have it tied to the base of the nose cone, then you can just drop it into a payload bay and the payload bay will protect it. You can wrap it 
in you know cotton or foam just to keep it from rattling around. It's pretty light. It's pretty durable. We've flown them a lot. Um, they work pretty good, but it doesn't come with a special box. Lots of Rockets asks, and this is like the most asked question on our website, is which fin shape is best for performance and why? So this rocket right here that I have, this is called our fin shape science fair kit. And what it allows you to do is to change out different fins on the rocket and you can drop the altimeter into the front end, just like that I just showed you with the missile meter. And then you can measure how high it goes. And if you use the same rocket motors for all the flights, you might notice a difference. And the question is, which of the fin shapes is best? If you go to our website. Here is the fin shape science fair experiment kit. But we have a newsletter and it's newsletter number 442. And it asks the question, What's the best fin shape for a model rocket? And again, this is one of those questions that says it depends. For low speed rockets, like your typical Estes model rocket, the best fin shape, I'm giving away the answer. So if you don't want a spoiler, turn your head away right now. And it's this one right here. This is the elliptical fin shape. And the question is, why is that the best? Um, and it has to do with induced drag. Induced drag means that it has been induced or triggered by something else. And what triggers that drag is lift. Here's a fin, if you look at it on an angle, if the rocket tilts and, the, and goes up, this is said to have an angle of attack. And that angle of attack is going to create lift. And that lift is going to cause induced drag. So you're going to get extra drag. Now, the elliptical fin shape has the lowest induced drag. When you get into higher speeds, then the answer is going to change. Let me bring this up here is in Roxim. So here is a rocket. Now, if you look at the edge of the fin, it's nice and square. This right here is called the airfoil. So if I look at just the edge, you can see it's a rectangle. And that rectangle is the worst airfoil that you can have on a rocket. To make it better, I'm going to open this up and I'm going to change this to 3D. Okay, so here is that rectangular shape. I can change it to a rounded shape. You can see that rounded edge, the front and the back have now been rounded. That is a much lower drag because the air can kind of go around the fin much easier. It's not like smashing right into it because it's nice and flush on that leading edge. So what's even better than the rounded is an airfoil. So the airfoil is this teardrop shape. If you have a choice, always, always, always make your fins airfoiled if you want the lowest drag. Now a rounded one and a squared off one, they'll work, but they're going to have higher drag. So you're not going to go as high. So if you want to lower the drag, always an airfoil shape. This airfoil shape is so much more effective than changing the shape of the fin. You know, I can use this shape fin, but if I compare it to this one, and this one has an airfoil and this one does not, this one's going higher. Airfoils are more important than the shape of the fin. Michael Kiesel, 1646, writes, what size parachute to use for different rocket weights. Okay, so let's go back to the Apogee website here. I have a different newsletter for that. So we're gonna to go to the how-to and guides on any of the pages, come down here to Peak of Flight newsletter. And then we wanna come over here to all newsletters and we wanna do a search on this for parachute. I've used parachutes 50 times. Let's see if I can find that specific newsletter issue. Okay, this is issue number 496. So if you click on one of these two links down here, it will take you to a article that will give you a chart. And I'm scrolling down here and I'll find this chart for different size parachutes. So if we have a hexagon shaped parachute, you would use this chart. So you come down here and you say, my rocket weighs 150 grams. 
So if I have a 150 gram rocket, I'll come over here to the side and it's gonna be in that 24 inch diameter area. So it could be, you know, anywhere from 19 to 29, but that 25 will give you in a reasonable descent rate. So you always base the size of the parachute on the descent mass of the rocket. We don't care about anything else. We do, all we care about is how much mass is coming down. So these charts were also generated in Roxim. This rocket does not have a parachute in it. So I'm gonna cancel out of that. See if my changes no. I'm gonna put a parachute into this tube here. It always asks you what size parachute, but I don't care right now. Our current descent mass is right here. Unfortunately, I don't have a motor in it, but assuming I had a motor in it, we look at this descent mass, and then we want to go a preset rate. So there's three preset rates, and most of them you're going to be in the medium descent rate. So if I click on that, it will tell me my descent rate is about... 8.9 miles per hour and I want um, a parachute about 27 inches so you can see right here the outer diameter is 26.9 or, or 27 depending on on that specific mass so if you change the mass it's going to change the diameter that you're going to want to use so if you want to dial it in even better use Roxim for that Thanks for watching. If you have other questions, just, you know, be sure to come to the Apogee website. You'll find our contact form there where you can ask your question. We also have this free newsletter. Please be sign up for it. It's like where you get all this information. Like I said, you know, you saw we, how many hundreds of videos we have, hundreds of newsletters that we have. Well, you get notified of these newsletters every week because we put one out every week and they're all great how-to information like what you're watching right now. So be sure to subscribe to that newsletter. Again, my name is Tim Van Milligan. This is the Apogee Rocketry Workshop. May the winds be light, may the skies be blue, may all your rockets fly straight and true.